aspiring minimalists, and welcome to today's episode of Cut the Crap, the podcast that helps you focus on what matters. Quick question, do you feel swamped in life and overwhelmed with clutter? Have you had trouble throwing things out? Have you become a hoarder after your brain injury because you're afraid of losing stuff? Brain injury survivors with abnormal collecting behavior have been known to fill their homes with vast quantities of useless items, including junk mail and broken appliances. Despite showing no further interest in the collecting items, patients resist attempts to discard the collection. A pretty clear finding has been found with dealing with brain injury survivors with hoarding problems. Damage to a part of the frontal lobes of the cortex, particularly on the right side, was shared by individuals with abnormal behavior. Studies show that when this particular part of the prefrontal cortex is injured, the very primitive collecting urge loses its guidance. But don't worry. Just follow this elegant, life-simplifying rule, post-brain injury rule, and you will be a minimalist in no time. Today, on Time to Talk Traumatic Brain Injury. Now listen to this. 80% of your physical possessions contribute nothing to your happiness. Do you own 20 shirts? Wow, that's so many. How many do you really need? Only four, actually, because according to neuroscience, the brain can only handle twice as many shirts as you have nipples. Go on, ditch those excess shirts. I'll wait. Are you hesitating and clinging to your plethora of shirts? Here's the thing. 20% of your emotional attachments are hurting you. The desire to hoard clothing is a toxic emotion that will turn your bedroom into a bewildering trash heap. If you're going to clear clutter, don't forget about relationships. Just 30% of your relationships actually serve you. Most of them are pointless. Remember that your favorite client care worker is top dog, and you should keep a small photo of him or her on your fridge inside a popsicle stick frame that reads, Best Client Care Worker. The others are good, but not as good as the person on the popsicle stick. By the way, I'm selling 8x10 mug shots on myself for a very good price. So today, sit back, relax, grab one drink, not two, one snack, not three, as we talk to brain injury survivors who have become minimalists, and in so taking this new lifestyle approach, have actually seen improvements in their post-injury day-to-day living arrangements. Let's go and enjoy Time to Talk Traumatic Brain Injury. It is important for the housing to be accessible for the individual with TBI, but the specific accessibility adaptations to use depend on the specific impairments of the individual. If the individual is using a wheelchair, then typically the home should include entry-exit doorways and room doorways that are wide enough to allow the wheelchair to pass. Also, having countertop space, cabinets, and equipment at wheelchair height is important. The first survivor we'll talk to today is Pat. Pat is a 67-year-old gentleman who is a stroke survivor of about seven years now, and he lives in a big house independently. He has some people coming in to help him to clean and to do his cooking about once a week, but he is independent in this big house, about 1,500 square feet, and we'll talk to him about his living arrangements and how he's adapting to it. Well, hello there. I'm sitting in Pat's living room. Pat has a beautiful, beautiful house here in Victoria, and he's moved in here. How long ago did you move in here, Pat? You've been here, what, 40 years? 44. 44 years. Okay, so when you moved in here, you moved into this 1,500-square-foot house, a big, big home, and you live here alone. And what was it like when you when you moved in? Was it Who was the gentleman that lived here? What happened? Give us the situation when you actually moved in here. The guy... It is all <clears throat> um, the guy was here alone. Okay, and his wife has died. Okay, and he, and he was really um, uh, mixed up. Mixed up, not very, not very healthy. Uh, well, he smoked. He. Uh, after his wife had died, mm-hmm. uh, he, he, he would 
um, very bad. Was he messy? N- no. What about what about the state of the of the house when you moved in here? Was the house cluttered? Was it uh, was there lots of furniture around? Or what was it like when you moved in here? It it, it was bad because his wife had died. Yeah, and um, uh, and the, the whole thing. Um, he sat in a chair and and smoked. Okay, and it didn't do anything. Yeah. And so, was there lots of furniture in the house when you moved in here? Was the house crowded with furniture? Yes. And did he take anything with him when he left, or he just? He took a few things, but um, not very many. But the house was cluttered when you got here. Yeah. And did the cluttering of the house, did lots of furniture and stuff in the house, did that interfere with your? Uh, ability to um, enjoy a new, a new space or how did you get around with all the clutter did you declutter did you simplify what did you do well um, when I moved here uh, 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 my brother came with me he was very he d- just came in and threw everything out <laughs> he just got, got get rid of everything he, yeah and then he brought his own thing in okay okay and it was bad tons of stuff was in here yeah and so to make it more enjoyable for you to make it more livable you had to get rid of some stuff you had to simplify things right so you just have by simplifying we talked about just having what you need and so have you, throughout the years, have you simplified this house? Is it, you have quite a big home here. Um, have you simplified it? Do you have just things that you need, or you still would like to maybe get rid of some stuff? I m- moved all the um, um, into the attic. Oh, is it, the attic's full of stuff. It's full. <laughs> so what's in the attic is not uh, to be seen here on the main level and in the basement. In the basement, you have a workshop, right? Yeah. Okay, and you don't go down there very much since you're injured, correct? Yeah. Okay, so you're up here on the main floor, and the main floor, we're in, we're in the living room now, looks very, very simplified, and the only thing that really is on the floor are the legs of the furniture. You have a beautiful sofa. Is the kitchen adaptable for you? Have you changed anything for the kitchen, meaning that you have access to the closets and access to the cupboards and things and fridge? You have you have good, it's easy to get to those things now? Yeah. And being in uh, your, your mobility after your stroke is a little bit, uh, is a little bit, um, Damage, so we want to make sure that you have the ability to walk freely and you don't have anything intruding your your space here in the house. Yeah, it's is that important to you to have a, a empty a, a empty spaces? Yeah, um, y- yeah, to, it helps you. Yeah. And what does what does it mean to to have a, a place for you this big? Is it is it difficult to live in a, a big space? We're gonna be talking to Eddie after you, and Eddie lives into, in a very small space, and it's quite difficult for him to simplify things and get rid of things. So he has so much stuff, he doesn't know where to put it. Unlike you, he doesn't have an attic to put things in, so he's got a very small space. And it's quite cluttered. Um, How's it for you living in a in a big house? Uh, is it is it f- easier for you to live in a, in a big home? Everything in here is free. Oh, so when the German left, you told me he left all the furniture here. Yeah. Most of the stuff he left here. Okay, so when you moved in this house, um, he did take some furniture with him, but he left a lot of stuff behind, and you ended up keeping the, a lot of the stuff, didn't you? Yeah. Because that, that was what you needed. So you didn't, did you have a lot of stuff of your own to bring in? Yeah, like that. Chair. Okay, so some basic chairs and stuff you brought in, but not a whole bunch of stuff. That's a, a 68-year-old, uh, and I was born in that. Wow. So the chair I'm looking at right here is 68 years old? Oh, my. So there's things in this house that are really important to you and have, have a historic meaning or a, a meaning to your family. But when I look around here, you have beautiful furniture, you have everything that you need, and what I'm talking about is being able to simplify. Were you, do you think the gentleman who lived here before he was a hoarder, collected lots of things and didn't think those uh, out? No, he, he 
discs after his wife died. Mm-hmm. He sat down. So he didn't do anything. He d- didn't do anything. Oh, so he didn't collect anything. He didn't. He didn't buy anything. He just was a very, very, a very stagnant lifestyle. Just very, yeah, very. Um, yeah, he w- w- was dead. Dead in a in a terminology, not just yeah. didn't do anything. This he just stayed in his chair and didn't uh, do any activities or yeah, didn't collect things. All or his yeah. pictures, and okay, everything is. I've got it. Oh, everything's still in the attic. So when you moved in here, this place was quite busy with all the furniture and things, and you wanted to get rid of it to get your own stuff in here, and you put all his stuff in the attic. So the attic again is is packed of things, yeah, of of his old stuff, right? Yeah. And then you and your brother bought new stuff in here, and it was important for you to keep this place neat. Obviously, how do you keep this place so neat, Pat? Every time I come in here, it's incredibly clean. How do you how do you keep oh, well, this? Well, it's bad f- for me. What do you mean? What do you mean bad for you? Because it's so messy. You think it's messy in here? Uh, oh yeah. And what? Just I mean, the cl- do you have clutter in here? Yeah. And why does clutter bother you? Why is it, it d- doesn't bother? Oh, me. clutter does not bother you. Yeah. Does t- clutter get involved in, get uh, in the way of your living um, habits with your disability and things? And your it, it does. How clutter doesn't get in the way? No. So why do you think there's clutter here? Why? Why do you just don't don't worry about it or d- just don't worry about it just <laughs> but eventually you have to get rid of some clutter like if it if it keeps on piling up you have to get rid of it don't you well uh, <laughs> like your uh chair right yes there yeah what i'm sitting on yes um that's 40 years old wow so the things that you have around here are quite old and just yeah. kind of like you're leaving them around and clutter does not seem to i mean we're looking at lots of papers and stuff like that but that doesn't seem to get in your way um no. it, it's fairly neat here as i said i think it's quite clean do you have any help that comes in to help you clean up the house or uh, one time every two weeks oh good okay yeah but someone comes in every two weeks and they they kind of get rid of the clutter and then you yeah. can start to kind of reclutter as things go on yeah. so that's interesting that you have clutter but it doesn't really bother you to be able to no. do your daily activities your cooking and your your washing and things like that so it, it, it's not, well, not that way do, do you clutter I have. <laughs> do I clutter? <laughs> yeah, I have clutter, but my wife would kill me if I had too much clutter. So I have. I make sure it's always clean every day. So when I do my work and stuff like that, I have papers all over the place. And again, too, it's funny when they talk about brain injury survivors. They don't want you to touch anything that they have on their desk because they have a way of organizing things that's different from everybody else and they know where things are so example if i'm going to look around this house and i see some clutter and i was going to ask you specifically where something is would you know where it is yeah if i asked you where your daily paper was you know where it is i know it's on the kitchen table but you know where it is you know where things are although it might be cluttery to other people to you it's a sense of organization isn't it yeah yeah and that's what the organization is is a really uh funny thing when you talk about brain injury survivors because they all have their own style of things and so never it's never really messy to a brain injury survivor it's organized it's a messy organization in a sense isn't it Yeah. yeah so and again too when we talk to eddie um how do you think what would happen if you lived in a really small space would it still be full of clutter you think yes would that be would that be a uh, dangerous or would that be um very um very hard to live in a space that was full of clutter like eddie's apartment i think is maybe maybe 500 square feet if that and he's got tons of stuff in there he has musical instruments and he has lots of papers and lots of uh, files and things and um how how would you live in a what would you do differently in a small space uh, i would uh clean it up a a bit. And because this place is, is so large, there really isn't a necessity to clean it on a regular basis. Yeah. Just the, the clutter can can obviously build up until the lady comes to help you. Yeah. But if you live in a smaller space and to declutter and to simplify things, especially as a brain injury survivor, you would want to make sure it's relatively clean and, and you wouldn't have such clutter. Yeah. Because you don't you can't bring in stuff. Here you can bring stuff in and put and put in around in other rooms, but with Eddie, for example, it's one it's one big room. So you can't have a lot of stuff or be really uh, really cumbersome and that'd be be a big a big problem. Do you think cumbersome's a problem with or hoarding's a, a difficulty with brain injury survivors? They have trouble throwing things out? Uh, but, but yes, because uh, like I look at around here, and it looks like you have a lot of emotional attachment to things. Do you think brain injury survivors get emotionally attached to certain things like that we had before their injury and don't want to let them go, or wh- why do you think clutter is a big problem with brain injury survivors? I don't know, don't, but do you agree it might be? Yeah. 
Did you have any difficulty? Do you have any difficulty with, with not being able to throw things out? Yes. Yeah. What would be difficult for you to get rid of? Oh, so the books that are here, the chairs that are here, so things that have emotional value to you. Yeah. Okay, so again, they say in articles that if something didn't have, you don't have a need for something, get rid of it. But do you have a need for things that are emotionally attaching to you? What, what is the need of something that you might not read all the books, or but why is it important for you to have things in your home that are emotionally close to you, you have an emotional attachment to why is that important? Like when you look at pictures and things, why is that important to you? Uh, I don't like pictures. And why is that? But what they, what does it do when you look? You have a lot of pictures of your family and things around. Why, why yeah. is that important? Does it bring well, back memories of any, any sort? Yeah. But yeah. Memories of you as a child and things in the, in the life yeah. you had before here and people that you want to remember. So although it's not cluttered, you do have a lot of things that are a memorabilia here. So if somehow you find a way to balance the memorabilia and mal balance the things that you need to, to live a, a functional life, then it's pretty good. But clutter is... Uh, is, is going to be a real problem when you have a small space. So do you consider yourself lucky that you live in a, in a bigger bigger house? Yeah. And living independently is not a problem? You, you do, seem to no. do quite well? No. Yeah. yeah. You have someone that comes in once a week to clean and someone that comes in once a week to um, help with, with food and things like that. But yeah. you have everything you need because you're quite independent. It's, it's quite quite nice to, to be here. And again, I'm so impressed with when I come in here. It's always nice and clean. You, and you even have animals too. Yeah. You have cats, right? Yeah. And do the cats get in the way of the uh, of your life at all? No. No. And taking care of them is not a problem at all? No. Do they add some quality to 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 your yeah. life? And how's that? How do the little cats add a quality to your life? They look uh, I I don't know where they go. <laughs> but I always they come back. So they always they're always here for you and they, yeah. they kind of rely on you, don't they? Yeah. So they're, they're friends in a sense, aren't they? Yeah, it's yeah. what you need. Well, thanks, Pat. Thank you very much. It'll be fun to go and visit Eddie's house and to see what that's like living in a smaller space uh, in, uh, in difference to what this place is, a, a big, big home that you live in and quite do, do quite well living independently, Pat. So thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. I want to give very much thanks to Pat for letting us into his house to see it firsthand and how he's doing living independently in such a big, beautiful house. Now we're going to change gears a little bit and go see Eddie. Eddie lives at the Mary Cridge Manor and his apartment is maybe 500 square feet as mentioned before. Unlike Pat, Eddie is able to move around quite easily. He suffers from cognitive, perceptual and behavioral problems, especially short term memory. So let's talk to Eddie about how he adapts his environment into helping him with remembering things from day to day. We're going to talk with our friend Eddie. Now, Eddie, we're going to talk about living arrangements and how you declutter and how you live in a smaller area. We talked to Pat yesterday and he lives in a, about a 15 to 1600 square foot house. And how many square foot is your I have apartment? not measured my place. I think your bachelor apartments here are about five to 600 square feet. Less than that. Okay. Less, less than that. that. So Eddie, tell me about your living arrangements and how you... How do you arrange your apartment for living in a in an accessible place where it's it's uh, easy to live and you can remember things? And tell me what your apartment, what your living space is like. Well, I have a uh, small small place. You can walk straight in, and then I have a nice couch that's in the corner as you first walk in. Um, the the bed or the the couch folds out to a bed if you want to do that, but I don't do that. Um, and then. Uh, on the other side of a cabinet that we put there, which has shelves on it, hmm. to kind of keep my stuff organized or keep myself organized, it kind of separates the bed from the the rest of the room. And where were you before you came to the MCM? McDonald House. Okay, so is your uh, apartment here bigger or smaller than the McDonald House? Much, much bigger. Much bigger. So did you have a lot of stuff, in McDonald House? We worry about hoarding survivors and hoarding and keeping lots of stuff. Pat was saying that hoarding is not a big problem because this place is so big that he gets to it when he gets to it. I mean, let's things gather and he'll get to the cleaning when he gets to the cleaning. But for you, if you let things gather in a smaller environment, it, it really could be a problem. I certainly have um, storage things filled with stuff that maybe don't need to have stuff in them because mm. I... I just I don't use much of the stuff that's stored away. I have the things that I use out and accessible at all times. And that's what we're saying. The saying, in regardless of the environment you live in, as long as you have what you need, if you have what you need, there, and the other stuff is really not not essential, have what you need there. So you have what you need in your in your apartment. I do. Yes. Would you be more comfortable in a bigger space, or what would you do with more space? I would find that I would have more space to clean. Okay, so you're happy where you are now. 
Yes. Okay. And is it accessible for you? I mean, having we know you suffer from uh, some some memory problems. Yeah. What do you do in an environment like this? We have to remember the stove's on or stove off. I remember in occupational therapy, I had to have ribbons all over the place to remember things are on and off. What do you do, Eddie, to make your place accessible for living with a brain injury? Um, after I use something, I just I just make sure everything's off. So you do a, a, yeah. a double check. Yeah. Okay, and that, that's good enough. You know, nothing's happened since, and you feel safe in that environment. Never had any issues. Mm, fantastic. That now let's fun. go to Jim. Jim, you said that you were in Eddie's apartment last night. In my mind, I was. Oh, <laughs> your mind. I was visiting Eddie, and he didn't know I was there. <laughs> so tell me, Jim, uh, what do you think Eddie's apartment? And you said, could you live there? Or what would the situation well, be? Well, I had a chance to move into that place before he did, mm-hmm. and. Um, uh, I liked how he's got it laid out because I was there visiting. We were doing some stuff, and uh, I was surprised how he's got it laid out. Uh, and then the one thing, Ed, though, about what space you got to clean, you got way more shelf space now, though, that needs to be cleaned with the stuff that's on top of it <laughs> for the dusting. So it, it, it kind of right. adds up. But um, the thing was is that... Um, you end up with aisleways in small places. Yeah, what do you mean by the way he's got things laid out? What, what do you mean by that? Well, it looks good. Huh, okay. Like, he's got good stuff that okay. looks good. It's not like it's a bunch of Oh, junk. laid out oh, design-wise. And the quality of the stuff that he's got okay. in there is good. So, like, so when you're looking with your eyes, it's not clutterish. Hmm, hmm. And, and just, you know, because sometimes you're doing the best you can, you end up getting stuff that's secondhand and ragged as hell. Hmm. And then it's like somebody explained to me that my place is a reflection of the inside of my head. Yes, yes. That's and, actually good. Uh, I was, wow. And safety wise, we're talking about Pat's place. Pat's, of course, is a big house, but he has big entrances because Pat sometimes is, is his mobility is not the greatest. So he needs wider spaces to get through. And Eddie, do you, do you feel Eddie's got a, a big enough place to get through and be safe to get uh, from, from place to place, from, from room to room without going, riding into anything or having any danger in any way? His, his space is big enough for that? Well, I just find that from being in places like that myself, uh, I end up with physical problems from just having to be mind, so mindful when you're going through the space. Hmm. Hmm. So on the days when you're having problems and you're having problems being mindful, if you don't have the extra five feet to swagger from side mm-hmm. to side, mm-hmm. you're cramped. And yeah. it's literally like being in a large size. Like the newer suites that they're putting out for people are 250 square feet That's or small. less. That's small. So they, this is why they're tearing the buildings down because they can fit two apartments into the space of no a one small is. one bedroom like mine is 550 square feet my one bedroom hmm. and so they can fit two places into that same footprint which is that's what they're doing so that it's not like people and then making people say well uh, you should be grateful for having this place well i should be grateful being in an institution mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and there and it it affects people like mm-hmm. And it's not like asking for the world, but there was a, you know, there was a time when a, when a, a bachelor suite was bigger. Mm-hmm. They just were. So having a bigger space would be more accessible for it be, be a lot yeah, more. It's not about packing more stuff in. It's just about like, like some of the people I know. They have room for a fold out couch, and they don't have room for a dining room table. Mm-hmm. It's a choice. Yes. Uh, if they have a bed, they can't have a dining. They can't have chairs. They can have two. If they have a fold out couch, they can fold it up and have room for two chairs and a small table to have a, to have a friend over. That's how small mm-hmm. these places are. Jim, if you were going to give the three top things that had to be a necessity for a 500 square foot uh, apartment for a ranger survivor, what would you think the three necessities would be? What would have to be there for them to to function a, 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 with a good good existence or well, have a good Well, they do a good job of that here, like mm-hmm. Eddie's place. Mm-hmm. Like, this place is good. Um, I I don't know, because it's, it's older, mm-hmm. but, it, you know, it's good. Plus, you've got the office down here. Right. It's, so, it's, it's geared for that. So as long as they have a, a clean kitchen or a workable kitchen, a place to, to, to rest or a, a bedroom area yeah. and a place for leisure activities. In the bachelor suites, now you're, you're, you're running into a difficult situation. If you need to do things like stretching and exercises in your place, you got to leave. Yeah, okay. If you, you okay. Know. And that, I don't, 
see how that f fits into a person's well-being if they just made them, you know, 500 square feet. Mm -hmm. If they made them 500 square feet, it would make it that much more easier. It's when they're getting them down like next 250. door. 250. Those will be 250 or less square feet. Hmm. That's, yeah, that's small. 10 that's by small. 20. That's small. That's small. Right? So hmm. 10 feet by 20. Well, I want to thank our guest today for joining us on Time to Talk Traumatic Brain Injury, the podcast for survivors for the entire brain injury community. And you know what? Living spaces are very important. You can be spending a lot of time there, although it could be 500 square feet or 1,500 square feet. You've got to make it accessible and you've got to make it enjoyable, but you've got to make sure it meets your needs as a brain injury survivor. So thanks for the tips, guys. So once again, thank you very much for joining us on Time to Talk Traumatic Brain Injury. And we look forward to seeing you next time. In a couple of weeks, we'll talk about another exciting, productive, and informative podcast for you, the brain injury survivor and their loved ones. Take good care. Bye-bye. Views and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the Time to Talk TBI panel and other contributors. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of the Cridge Centre for the Family Brain Injury Services. We value your feedback and comments. Email us at tbipodcasts at cridge.org.